Hello and welcome back to Business Matters at the Hindu with me, K. Bharat Kumar. Over the past few days, global leaders have been gathering in Egypt to discuss climate change. It's an annual event called COP or the Conference of Parties. Why is an annual event needed? After all, commitments to meet certain deadlines to keep climate change at bay are made in terms of decades. For example, India made a commitment to go net zero emissions by 2070. But an annual reminder looks necessary because we are teetering on the edge when it comes to climate change. Further, the pandemic and the war in Europe between Russia and Ukraine has made it more difficult for countries to move away from fossil fuels that contribute to emissions that contributes to climate change. Before we dive into what's new this year, here's some context. Countries recognized in COP 2015 that it is necessary to cap the average increase in global temperatures to 2 degrees centigrade or preferably 1.5 degrees centigrade compared with pre-industrial levels that is prior to 1900. Many estimates have us know that we will reach this level of global warming starting 2032 or thereabouts. Here's a verbatim commitment from that conference. The Paris Agreement is a legally binding international treaty on climate change. It was adopted by 196 parties at COP21 in Paris on 12th December 2015. Its goal is to limit global warming to well below 2, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. To achieve this long-term temperature goal, countries aim to reach global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible to achieve a climate neutral world by mid-century. What would happen if we did not at all act on climate change? What if global warming happened at a wild pace? The topic is too vast to confine into one conversation. But here's a short take. The earth would face losses of all sorts, environmental, economic, social, emotional. But here's just one small example. If the globe exceeds this target of 2 degrees centigrade, coral reefs that you find in oceans would all disappear. They support 25% of marine life, even though they occupy only 1% of ocean beds and they literally stem the tides, they prevent coastal erosion. And we as humans would also face fiercer calamities. The drought in Europe, horrific floods in Pakistan, heat wave after heat wave in India earlier this summer that impacted our crop output, all of these in 2022. These are all clear signs. What is different between this year's COP, COP27 and the earlier ones? Compensation against loss and damage due to climate change is finally on the main agenda. Earlier too, this topic was discussed but it was on a separate track. Why is compensation critical as also fair? Developed countries have benefited enormously from industrial development between 1900 and now. But these have also contributed to GHG emissions or global greenhouse gas emissions. Developing countries have been relatively late starting out on economic development. They may be contributing to emissions now, but that is too weak a reason to ask them to stop economic development. So if I'm a farmer somewhere in rural Africa, neither my country nor I have contributed emissions historically, but my agricultural productivity yield, both are getting impacted now because of emissions of industrial nations from the past. Or if I'm an urban worker somewhere in South America, I have to work without choice in unforgiving heat wave conditions, again caused by emissions of the past by industrial nations. So to attempt to correct this imbalance, options like financing by the developed world for underdeveloped or developing nations have been discussed for a few years now. But as a popular newsletter called Finshots asked recently, the nub lies here. Who decides who should pay whom and how much? The Our World in Data website cites data from the Global Carbon Project to show that between 1751 and 2017, 47% of all carbon dioxide emissions came from just 29 countries, the EU 28 and the US. How badly have these emissions hurt others? A paper published by Springer Link under the climate change umbrella earlier this year shows that emissions attributable to the US alone over the period 1990 to 2014 caused losses that are concentrated around 1-2% to 2 of per capita GDP across nations in South America, Africa and South and Southeast Asia. But emissions may have also helped a few countries. 
such as those in Northern Europe and Canada, for example. Moody's Analytics has estimated that by the middle of the century, Canada would see a rise in GDP of 0.3% or about $9 billion a year as warmer climates spur agriculture and labor productivity. The Canadian Climate Institute, though, has cautioned that such a claim was not wholly true and other factors mattered. For example, it claimed that climate change spurred floods could cost Canada $17 billion annually by 2050. In these wars of words, the only certainty is the fast approaching calamity. The UN Environment Programme's annual emissions gap report for 2022, released late last month, said the international community is falling far short of the Paris goals, with no credible pathway to 1.5 degrees centigrade in place. Only an urgent, system-wide transformation can avoid climate disaster. The world must cut emissions by 45% to avoid global catastrophe. Where does India stand on emissions? The same report says that India is among the top seven emitters, the others being China, the EU, Indonesia, Brazil, the Russian Federation and the US. These seven countries plus international transport account for 55% of global emissions. Or if you just want to look at it country-wise, the top G20 account for 75% of today's global emissions. If as a country, India seeks economic development, some emissions are unavoidable. But the data that we just quoted, if we put it in the context of emissions per head, then the picture changes completely. In 2020, the world average per capita GHG emissions were 6.3 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. The US was at 14, the Russian Federation at 13, China at 9.7, India at 2.4, far below the global average. In addition to committing last year that we would go net zero emissions by 2070, India is also committed to ensuring that its renewable energy capacity touches 500 gigawatts by 2030, thereby bringing down the emission intensity of our GDP. It is also committed to raising forest cover. Last year, India was also responsible for a change in the wording of the agreement on coal. It was changed from phase out of coal to phase down, which reflects ground realities for us in terms of large energy requirements for economic development. Even now, India depends on coal to generate about 50% of its electricity. So how much financing was committed to and what is the status now? About $100 billion a year was committed to by developed countries in 2009. A report by the Center for Science and Environment cites data from the OECD indicating that $52.5 billion was mobilized in 2013. It dropped to about $44 billion in 2015, but since then, finance flow has steadily increased. In 2020, developed countries raised $83 billion. It was a jump from the $80.4 billion in 2019. Even these figures have received some criticism. Oxfam says that these figures include private finance and export credit and tags only 21 to 24.5 billion as genuine climate finance, which amounts to only one third of the OECD's own estimates for 2020. And mind you, a significant portion of these commitments are not grants, but loans that recipients have to pay back. Are more funds needed? Without a doubt. We've had trouble meeting even the $100 billion a year plan that was put out in 2009. Now the estimates themselves have changed. The world would need excess of $6 trillion up to 2030 to help developing countries meet their climate goals. In summary, the headlines that have dominated this year's climate conference show that there has been little concerted effort the world over to keep emissions low so as to help retain global warming within target. We will bring you an update if anything more exciting is announced before the conference ends. Till the next episode of Business Matters, it's goodbye from us. Have a lovely week ahead.